Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to The Geek Group. Today, we get to make a video that I've wanted to do for a long time and it's just one of those we never really got around to making. We get a lot of people that, they're scroungers and they come across things at garage sales and stuff like that, old bits of technology and they write in asking all kinds of questions and I never have time to answer all of them. And this is gonna handle easily a thousand pieces of viewer mail that we've gotten over the years Today, we're gonna to talk about reel-to-reels because this is a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. This, in fact, is an old TX 3340S. I have no idea why I'm talking to this microphone because that one isn't even on at the moment. But this is a TX 3340S. It is a classic four-track reel-to-reel. And this one is particularly special because if you're a scrounger, it's one that you're very likely to come across. They were hugely popular. And this particular, this, this reel-to-reel -reel is like the jumping point because there's God knows how many thousands and thousands of reel-to-reels out there that are two tracks and can't actually do multi-track recording. They work like a really big cassette deck. They, both tracks are on, both tracks off. This particular model and its variants, there's like the 3340, 3340SX, a334, all that. There's another one over there that I've had. That's actually my first professional reel-to-reel -reel over there. That's, that's what fundamentally started the geek group and built my first recording studio and all that. But they're all pretty much the same. And this is the first step in the technology where you can do actual real multi-track recording. Now, I know that there's a whole world of people out there that have no idea about anything that isn't nonlinear. You grew up in a world of hard drive editing and things like that, but nothing replaces this. It's, the quality isn't as good as digital, absolutely. Um, the editing is a nightmare because you're talking about razor blades. But it's got soul, and that's the only way I can really describe it. And for those of us that grew up in the analog world, this is just awesome. And I wanna make a video right now where we can talk about tape and multi-track tape and touch on a little bit of history, touch on how it works, the technology, some of the basics. We're gonna do a few videos in this series, but this is gonna be pretty much the intro. And it's gonna cover, if you just found one of these in a garage sale, what you need to know just some basics of reel-to-reel -reel recorders, how they work, how to thread it, how to make it play a tape, how to record something, just the basic stuff. And we'll get into some more advanced stuff as we go. If you have any questions for future videos on this, by all means, write in. Send us a message here on YouTube, comment, whatever, and I will do everything I can to address this in a future video. So with that, let's have some fun with analog audio. Now this basic reel-to-reel. -reel. When reel-to-reels started, when, when magnetic recording began, okay, you've got to go back to the dark ages. I, I can unplug that. I don't even need that in there. You've got to go back to the dark ages, okay? This is a time when people were recording on records, okay? And you can do a lot with just recording on turntables. You may have heard of a very famous guitar called the Les Paul. Well, Les Paul was actually a real guy. Les Paul invented the concept of what would become multi-track recording. He did it with overdubbing. And what Les Paul did was he took a couple record recorders, like, you know, records, vinyl records, and he'd play the guitar, because that's why they named a guitar after him. He wasn't a drummer. He'd play a guitar and record it onto a record, and then he'd take that record and put it on a record player and play himself back and play along with it and record both parts into, into his record recorder. So this allowed him to be his own accompaniment and it allowed him to do a lot of really interesting things. And this evolved into the first reel-to-reel -reel recorders because you have a supply reel and a take-up reel. And the very first ones, can you grab the uh, magnetophone over there? The very first ones didn't have tape because tape hadn't been invented yet. What they did have was wire. And they used iron, and some of the later ones used stainless steel. And they, they were these things. Thank you. And we'll, I'll set this up like this so you can really get a good look at it. 
This is a wire recorder, and I actually addressed it by its wrong name. This is not a magnetophone. This is a Webster Chicago, which made a lot of these. Um, but this is a wire recorder. If you ever see one of these in a garage sale, get it. They're hard to come by these days. You don't want to actually record anything, but the audio quality sucks. But uh, we are looking for these for our archives, so get it and let me know. Um, but the way, the, the big giveaway that this is a wire recorder is if you look under here, if you zoom in right there, you can see it. See how the head is just, a, it looks like a little V pulley. It's a little, little tiny notch right here. And down in there is a V. It looks a lot like a knife sharpener. If you've ever seen one of those knife sharpeners with the, the block and the V and you just drag a knife through it, it looks very similar. And this lets us start on how magnetic tape works, okay? Because when they first started out, ooh, I'm gonna need some markers. We'll get to that in a second, but I'm gonna need some whiteboard markers. Um, when they first started out, the, they'd use wire, and they had a magnet, which was shaped like a C, and the wire went through the magnet, and it polarized the wire vertically. Okay, like we now use for perpendicular data storage, same kind of concept. It was recorded up and down in the wires. The wire went by, it recorded it in slices, which worked really, really well. The problem was, as the wire goes by, you get north, south, north, south, you know, in varying degrees in between. But everything worked great until you hit a point, thank you, where the wire twists as it goes through, and if the wire rolls because the wire's round, it all goes away, you, you get fade outs. And that was a problem that plagued wire recorders in the early days. The way this works is most people in today's world are used to recording through uh, ADC, which is analog to digital conversion, okay? If you look on the back of a modern day CD-ROM, a lot of them, not all of them anymore, but uh, you'll see it a lot. You'll see a symbol that'll look like this with three boxes. And most of them today say D, D, D. The last box will always be a D. But this means it was recorded, mastered, and then published in analog or digital. If it was recorded on reel-to-reel, -reel, the first box will be an A. Okay, that's your original recording. And then when they make the master, that could be an A or a D. And then the third one, since it's a compact disc, will always be D. But the way digital recording works is you take a waveform, like let's say this is our wave, and you cut it into a whole lot of pieces. And then you assign all those pieces a value. And you get, like on this waveform here, we would have here, and here, here, here. Okay, this is really, really crude, but you get the idea. And digital cuts it up into a lot of pieces. And let's say we're dealing with just a compact disc. The number of pieces is 44,100 slices a second. And each one of these slices is a sample. And that's just, that's for each track. And then each of these are 16 high. Now they're 16 bits. So a bit is like that's one sample, a 16 digit number. I think I got that right. But <laughs> so to record a CD, when you when you get the music off a CD, you're getting 44,100 of these numbers every second just for audio. So it's a massive amount of data, massive. And that's just CD quality. DVD takes it up another notch. Okay, this is only 44.1. It can get significantly more in depth than that. But that's the basics of it. You're taking an analog signal because all the sound you hear, your ears are analog. All the sounds that you say and hear, every, every sound you've ever heard in your life is an analog waveform. You convert to digital, you get CD. Well, this works if you can handle tons of numbers and digital conversion and all that stuff in real time, and that's, that's a whole problem. So before that, before all this existed, a long, long time ago, like, you know, the 90s, this is how it was done. You have 
your microphone. And into this microphone, you're putting an analog wave. And that microphone has an amplifier. And that amplifier feeds out to the tape deck. And inside the tape deck, you have a head. Now, let's draw what a head looks like. A head looks kind of like this. And feeding into that head, you have a coil of wire. Okay. Now, because the head has a little tiny, like microscopic gap in it, the magnetic field of the head is focused right here. It wants to shoot out. So rubbing along the head, directly in contact with it, we put a piece of tape. And the tape looks like this. And we'll zoom in really close on that. And you can see that tape is actually brown. Now, the reason that tape is brown is because it's coated in rust. The tape is made of a layer of plastic. Okay, So we start with a layer of plastic. And on the layer of plastic, we put a very, 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 very fine powder that is iron oxide. And then they put another layer of plastic on top of it and seal that in. So since the iron particles are all really, really, really tiny little super fine dust, as they roll over this, they get magnetized. On its own, it's not magnetic. When it's just blank raw tape, it's not magnetic. But it's ferrous, which means we can magnetize that. And we can store that exact waveform in here over time. So later, now remember the lesson when we, we've talked about this before. If you have a magnet and you have a wire, and you move the magnet near a wire, you induce an electrical current in the wire. Okay, you get electricity. You move the magnet, you get electricity. If you have a wire and you put electricity through it and you make the magnet, you can make this magnet move. Okay? Electricity and magnetism, same thing. So if we have a coil around this and we've still got, we, we take another amp on this side. Actually, we'll, we'll just do this totally separate. Watch. Because this will be more accurate to how they really work. We make another coil over here. And we hook that to an amp. Now, instead of amplifying the microphone, we use this the exact same way. Because the microphone has a coil of wire in it and it moves with a magnet, and it generates that. It converts this analog waveform into an electrical analog waveform. We amplify that. We can print it to tape. Well, now the tape itself is the magnet. The tape is magnetized. Very, very tiny. Like it's, it's, it's less energy than the microphone creates. The microphones create an amazingly tiny amount of energy. As the magnet moves over the coil, it induces that same analog waveform in this wire we can amplify that and send that out to our speaker. That's the basics. So if we add a third head, because now we can record onto tape and we can play back off tape, if we want to record again, we need one here. Now this is the easy head. This is the erase head. Okay, this here is the record head and this is the play head. The erase head doesn't go to anything. The erase head just goes straight down to an AC waveform, which is, let's say, 60 hertz. Just plug it right into the wall. And that's just an electromagnet. And what that's doing is randomizing the tape. And it isn't like 60 hertz. It's actually a much higher frequency. Um, but this erases the tape. And this is just a, a white noise electromagnet. So it's getting like static. Works the same way as this if you just fed this white noise static. So that's how that works. So we've got three heads, erase, record, and playback. And we've got our tape. Now, I got to move around the thing here. I got to come out front to show you guys this. So give me a second. All right. Now, you've seen the erase, record, playback heads in simulation on the whiteboard there. Let's take a look in real life. And I'll open this right up. Now, look down here. 
The tape starts on the left and goes to the right, always, left to right. So it comes off our supply reel through the guide rollers and all that, through here, and that's the first head. And it's, it's easy to see that it's different because it's got big, black, chunky coils on it. And the coils are inside the head. You're just seeing the faces and the gaps of the coils. But that's the erase head right there. That's the big electromagnet. And if you look at it really close, you can see there's four really big lines and then four really big lines that are just a little bit over. And that tracks one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, eight. This is an eight track unit. So that's how the tracks are set up in here. That's the erase head right there. And then we go over here and now all eight tracks are in a row up and down. That's the record head. And then we go to the next one and it looks exactly the same. This is the playback head. Now for some instances, the erase head and the playback head can be the same head. You can actually do that um, with the old TX, that's where you get into the simulsync or simulsync. That's, uh, that switch turns the record head into a playback head so that you can hear yourself. And we'll talk about tape delay and all that in a bit. But uh, even the old analog machines had latency. <laughs> but that's, that's how your heads work. So let's dig in. I'm going to head back there. We'll dig into this and talk about the basics of the machine. Now we see how head, heads work. And I can set this aside because we're not going to need this. Okay. Now, let's say you just found this in a garage sale. You don't know anything about it. You want to see if it works. You want to check it out. You bought it, you drug it home. You're probably not going to be able to check it in the garage sale because you have to plug it in, you have to put tape on it, you have to have an output source or something. Um, if you're lucky enough to have brought a set of headphones with you, you can probably test it there. But let's say you just drug it home, you don't know anything about it. First things first. On the back, because these get lost and you want to make sure it comes with it. With a lot of reel-to-reels, especially the TX, they come with a little plug. This is the remote control port. So here, I'll put it where you can get a really close look at it. Okay, this is what it looks like. The bottom looks like a vacuum tube. It really does. Okay, it's got a little arrow on it, points up, says TAC. Now, on a lot of these old decks, this will be missing because people will buy the remote control port for them and it won't be in the garage sale or something like that. If you don't have it, you can fake it with just a piece of wire. That's really all you need is you can, you can jumper it out with a piece of wire. But check and see if you've got that because if you turn it on and it doesn't work, that could be why. The other thing to make sure you get is the power cord. Now the power cords on these, just it's like an extension cord because they came with different types for different setups, but make sure it comes with that. So you've got all your parts, that's plugged in, that's good. Now here's the next thing you need to know. Turn it on and without doing anything, just by turning it on, over here, this is called the capstan. And the capstan controls the speed that the tape goes through. And next to the capstan is the pinch roller. Now there's two important things you want to make sure of, and this is a problem with the older machines because when they sit for a long time, they gum up a bit. If you just turn it on and lift this lever up like it has tape in it, you should hear a little click and the capstan should start turning on its own. Okay, you can hear that little click. And that's because there's a switch in here behind this that tells it to turn the capstan motor on. So we pick it up and the capstan starts turning. That's a good sign. If it doesn't, you've got a problem. Now the second thing, and I'm going to hold this with my hand just to keep it from eating me. If you lift this up and you push play, that should snap up. And if you let go of this, it should pop back down. But the mechanism that moves this also gets sticky over the years, and it might not move. So if you just simply lift this up and push play, it should move. And if everything's really good, this will start turning and everything's happy. So now we know this machine mechanically works. Now, you can fit two different sizes of reels on here. This is the big NAB hubs. Okay, and these are the, the great big full size, these are professional reels. 
Now, they also make smaller reels. They make little seven inch reels like this. And these were the standard for consumer grade stuff. And you'll notice they're almost always made out of plastic. Sometimes you'll see these in metal, but they're pretty rare. And then there's the itty bitty reels like this. And if it looks like this, it's probably a professional reel because this is how a lot of promo promos, commercials, things like that came, uh, PSAs and a million of them, um, for radio station use, for broadcasting. So you'll see a lot of these. And they only hold a few minutes of tape. And then you'll see these. And this is kind of cool. This one actually says Radio Shack on it in the old 80s logo. Check it out, the old Radio Shack logo. But this is a standard small reel. You can buy blank reels at Radio Shack, and they'd, they'd look like this. If you've got a little reel, they go right on here. This is how the machine comes from the factory, just empty like that. And this, the center bar, you can zoom in really close. You, it's got three little wings that move about, about 120 degrees or so. And you unscrew this out, and it'll stop on its own. Don't force it. And you make sure these are lined up. And you put this on. Now, when you put tape on the machine, it always goes outside to outside, okay, it goes outside. So when you put the reel on, the tape should go to the outside. Don't put the reels on like this, or you'll, play, you'll actually play the tape in the wrong way. It'll play, it just won't work right. So you put that on, and then you tighten this down, just snug, don't, don't reef it down. And now you're using the small reel, so you wanna have the reel here set to small. Now to lace the machine, this is, after you do this a dozen times, you'll be able to do it in your sleep, okay? But it's tricky the first time. You go outside the first one, and then straight down, and don't even worry about the heads because there's nothing there to mess with. And then you're gonna come up in between the capstan and pinch roller, and then down, and grab that second guide roller, and then bring it right up, and you're, you're totally outside the thing, okay? Bring it right up, outside the thing, now you'll notice these have holes in them. And the reason they have holes is so you can reach in there and pinch that and then just hold it. And if you just hit play for a second and let it wind all the way around, now you can just let go and it's fine. You have now threaded a reel to reel. If you do that, the minute this falls down, this stops it from going. Okay, that's, that's the switch. So if you hold this up and hit rewind, that's gonna spin like crazy. And if I hit fast forward, the big one will go. But the second to let go, it stops. And it's gonna coast for a while because I have it set to small reels. The big small reel controls the brake and the motor engagement. If you have it set to big reels and you're using small reels, you can risk stretching or breaking the tape. So that's how you put a little one on. If you are lucky and got a big 10 inch hub, then your world's a better place. But you'll notice that big thing won't really work in there. You need a hub adapter. And they look like this. Um, some look like this. This is, this is a standard TIAC hub adapter. And then this is an Akai hub adapter. And they're pretty much the same thing. They got a little itty bitty hole down the middle. And they've got a knob. Well, the itty bitty hole down the middle goes on your spindle. And then you tighten that down just like normal. And then, with the tape going to the outside, you put this on and you line it up to the three pins here. And then when you twist this, you'll see the pins come out of alignment to there. And then as you continue turning it, they don't move this way anymore, they start clamping in. So you hold the reel up here and just snug that down, and now it's on there good. So to thread it again, I'll turn so that close up can see me. We go over the guide roller under the heads, out between the capstan and pinch roller, and come up on this side. You just bring it right through, pull out a little tail, and hit play. Oh, you have to go over the capstan pinch roller and then grab the guide roller. It's weird to do it off on this side. <laughs> hit play, it'll wind up, and you're set. And now you're playing tape. At this point, we need to talk about monitoring. Let's, let's go through the knobs and we'll talk about what all the knobs and buttons do. First one is your power button, off and on. Real simple, okay? Then you've got real size, large and small. We'll set it to large. Speed, high or low. Now speed is a whole thing. 
For this machine, the speeds are, and this is the pretty common high and lows, is 15 IPS, which is inches per second, which is that fast. So it's cooking. And then low speed is half that, seven and a half inches per second. Now, in the professional studio world, 15 inches per second is the lowest that you're gonna get for professional equipment as a rule. Um, really super duper pro equipment goes up to twice that to 30 inches per second. 30 inches per second is pretty much the fastest you're gonna get for anything you're ever gonna come across. There's some oddball stuff, some really obscure video gear that went at like 100, 200 inches per second, but you're never gonna come across that. Um, 30 inches is for the best possible audio you can get. 15 is standard. Seven and a half is standard. That's, seven and a half was often the high speed for domestic, like consumer use outside of a studio. Um, most of these all ran, reels like this are, are all at like seven and a half. Some are at 15, but it's kind of rare. Um, then you can go down to three and three quarter, which is low speed, it's used for voice, stuff like that. Um, dictaphones, you'll sometimes see with that. Smaller reel-to-reels, like the real toy ones um, that go back to like the 50s and 60s. Uh, a lot of those had that. You can go down to less than that, which is one and seven eighths inch, which is really slow. And the slower you get, the, the worse the quality gets is the big thing. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think inch and seven eighths is, uh, what they used for cassettes. I could be wrong, um, but I, I think inch and seven eighths is what they used for like, you know, cassette tape, compact cassettes. And then there was the one lower than that, which is really hard to find, 15 sixteenths of an inch per second, which was used, you'll see it on, on decks similar to this, but it's got, it's, they're designed for um, air check tapes for radio stations, where it's just monitoring whole huge blocks of time and it's just for like when people come and complain because you're swearing on the air or stuff like that. It's called an air check tape. And you'll see them for like 911 calls and stuff like that. Really, really limited use. But almost everything you're going to come across is going to be in the 7.5, 15, 30 if you're really lucky range. So the faster you go, that's your bandwidth. It really is. The, the faster you go, the more data you can cram onto the tape and the better the quality is going to be. The limiting factors for tape quality are, it all boils down to how can you get more tape moving under the head for that thing. So you can either have wider tracks, wider tape, and this tape is quarter track tape. So this tape is exactly one quarter of an inch wide, okay? So that's quarter inch tape. You can fit at most four tracks on there. Now you can, you can and you'll often see quarter track two-track decks where it only plays two tracks, but you can take the tape off and flip it around and play the other side. And what that's doing is you've got, here, we'll clear this out. You've got your tape, like here's, here's your tape. And the tape's cut into four tracks. And this is track one, this is two. And if you're just playing the tape like that, these tracks are recorded going this way. Now if you've got a four track machine, this will be three and this will be four. So if you're recording on a four track machine, you'll get one, two, three, four, and they'll all go this way, okay? But if it's a two track machine, Tracks three and four, it's, it's not one, two, three, four anymore. It's more like A and B. And this is A for side one, and this is B for side one. And when you take the tape off and flip it around, this is A for side two, and this is B for side two, because they're, they're interleaved. It gets really tricky, but that's just how it works. And the reason they did this, the reason they put alternate tracks, is if you're recording just two tracks on a four track tape like this, where you've got an A and B, cassette tapes work the same way, by the way. Um, you've got your left channel and your right channel. 
And since heads aren't always perfectly aligned and you're dealing with magnetism, so sometimes it, there's a little bleed over here, this is called, when, you, when this track, when track A1 here is bleeding into B2, you'll actually hear a, little, a faint bit of A1 in B2. That's called crosstalk. And you want to minimize that as much as possible. So they put the two tracks because with stereo music, they're different, but they're really, really close. So these are going to have a very strong signal. And you want to get them away from each other. There's another weird anomaly that happens. It's called print through. Because as this is playing, it's winding. This is layer after layer after layer wound up on the spool. And these are magnets. And as we've learned, with the record head, you can magnetize the tape. And with the playback head, you can play back the magnetized tape. So the tape itself can be written to, and it has a magnetic charge, at the same time. So when they're packed in, and they're all perfectly lined up from all the guide rollers, and they're packed in nice and neat, it's possible that a layer of tape, if, if you've got them on your reel, and you've got these layers of tape, if this layer of tape right here has a really heavy drum hit, like a bass note, well, that can be so magnetized that it radiates these little magnetic flux lines out into the next layer of tape, and you can hear a faint bass drum hit there on the tape. And that's called print through, and it can go through several layers of tape. It's really cool. Um, and you'll hear that in working with reel to reels as a faint pre echo or post echo. So that's how you can make something echo from before when it actually happened, is through print through. And it's a pain in the butt if you're dealing with tape. So that's these three buttons. Now, over here, we've got our inputs and output levels. Now, this machine on the back has standard consumer RCA inputs. You can see them right down here, just four of them. Okay, we've got tracks one and three on top, and then two and four on the bottom. And then we've got our outputs in the same arrangement. And those are your line level inputs, which is like if you're hooking a mixing console into it or something like that, or a CD player or something. Those are line levels. Well, then you've got microphone level. Mic level's a lot lower, so you need a pretty good preamp before it. And by the way, the preamps in these old TX are awesome. So down here are your mic level and line level adjustments. And these four plugs here are your mic level inputs. So if we want to take a microphone, like the classic Shure SM58 standard mic, used all over the world. Well, it's got an XLR output, so we get a XLR to quarter inch TS, that's tip sleeve adapter, it's not balanced. And you just plug that in there. Because you can't just plug a mic into the back, it won't work, it doesn't have enough oomph. So we'll plug this in on channel one. And now, if we talk into the microphone, it's really hard to do this without being able to see it. There it is, okay. So our mic level, is the little knobs out here. And if I turn that up, it'll peg it out. And if I turn it down, it goes down like that. So that's our mic level. And then our line level is the big knob. So that's the plug going in the back. So these are how to adjust your inputs. And if you're used to recording with digital, when you hit red, brick wall distortion. Digital distortion is horrible. With analog, it's nice. And you can do things like have a really cool orbit-driven guitar and stuff like that. This when it crashes, it isn't a brick wall. It's a big, soft mattress of happy. So that's your input levels. Your output levels are in the same spot. Like channel one is right here for input levels, for mic and line. Output is right here. So that's one, that's one. They're always in the same arrangement. One, three, two, four. One, three, two, four. One, three, two, four. So they're always laid out the same. So these are your inputs. These are your outputs. And then as we go over here, these little indicators here are whether or not that track is armed to record, and we'll talk about what that means, but, and this is gonna seem really weird for a lot of people out there, this is what makes multi-track recording so awesome. If you have a regular cassette deck, or a CD recorder, or a whatever, and you record on the left track, and you don't have an input on the right track, you just record you know, singing on the left track, and you're like, well, I didn't use that other side. So then you rewind it or whatever, hit record again and plug into just the right track and try and record something where you're going to erase everything that was on the other track. You don't have to do that with this. That's what makes multi-track recording awesome. Because you can record something on this channel and then rewind the tape and then record something just on this channel. 
and still leave this here. And you can even hear this and sing along with it. And all kinds of possibilities happen. This is how it began. That's that concept of multi-track recording. It just it changed the whole world. It's really neat. So that's what these do, is these let you know which track is recording. And in fact, watch, we can do this. We'll hit record pause, and we need to arm some tracks. And they're all armed, right there. See, now see all the red lights come on? Now over here, these, I don't know if you can see those, but I'll try. I don't want to drop this off the table. All kinds of fun noises with bad old connections. But these over here are your record arming things. So like watch track one, see how that's lit up? If I go over here and flip this off, it goes out. So now I can record something on track two, and whatever I record on track one will stay there. Okay? Now, you've got your inputs and your outputs, and as you noticed earlier, when I was talking into the microphone, the needle moves like that. And that's because these four switches are set to source. So I'm listening, if, if you had headphones plugged into here, what am I stepping on that's making that angry? I think it's a mic cable. What, when you talk into the microphone, you're listening to the record head, you're listening to the input side. So you can flip these to tape, and now the needle doesn't move anymore because it's listening for things coming under the playback head. And this lets you be able to listen to monitor your input and your output so that you know you recorded it properly and your levels are good and all that jazz. And they'll sound different. You don't want them to sound different. You want them to sound as similar as possible, but they'll sound different. So these are our source monitoring. Now down here, we've got phones. This is where you plug in your headphones. Now, your regular iPod headphones will work just fine, but you're going to have to get a plug adapter because your little 8-inch TRS plug is not going to fit. So you get an adapter, and any professional set of headphones is going to come with an adapter, and you plug it in. Now, you can only listen to two tracks at a time. So if you've got a four-track thing going, you can listen to these two, and then you unplug it, and then you can listen to these two. But this will let you do your monitoring for whatnot, and you can just run the outputs. If you've got like a, a mixing console, you can run all your outputs into dedicated channels and all that, but we'll get there. Now, this is kind of a weird button. You can play back two channel tapes, and you'll notice these two just turn off. Oh, I found the source of this bad sound. Got a loose connection in there. That's kind of fun. Okay, so you can play just two channels or flip that down for four channel. And the reason for doing that is if you're just working with two channel tape and you've got like crosstalk or noise or something like that, that just kills power to the other two heads. So you won't, it just goes away. Um, it's a noise eliminator. It's, think of it as a tape equivalent to if you're working with a mixing console, muting unused tracks, same concept. And then over here, standard transport controls. And if you're buying a tape deck, you should know what these mean by now, but just in case you don't, that's play, the arrow to the left is play. Two arrows to the left is fast forward. Hang on a minute, I'm looking at this the wrong way. That's the right. Um, <laughs> so arrow, one arrow is play, two is fast forward, two going the other way is rewind. Record, stop, and pause. Stop stops everything. If you wanna play, just hit the button. If you wanna record, you have to press record and play to start recording right away. Usually the way it's done is you press record and pause, and now you've armed to record, and then you just hit play, and we're recording. The last thing is a little tape counter. Tape counters are their own measurement medium. It doesn't measure inches per second. It doesn't measure feet. It's not measuring any real number of time. It's just that's where zero is. Now, it's different with different tape decks, all the way up to the most advanced bestest, awesomest tape decks which actually measure SMPTE time, so they are very accurate. But usually the tape counter is just a number to give you an idea where you started. So you can punch the button and that'll set it to zero, start recording, record your song, and you know if you hit rewind and go back to zero and stop there, that's almost exactly where you started. It might drift a little, but it's analog. Enjoy the ride. If you want precision, go digital. If you want it to be fun, Enjoy analog. So that's all the basics that you need to know to just play with your new reel-to-reel -reel that you dug up at a yard sale, okay? Now in upcoming videos, we're gonna talk about more advanced techniques. We're actually gonna record and play back on some stuff. Um, in fact, in our next video, we'll show you how multi-track recording works. But for now, you've got your reel-to-reel, -reel, 
get a microphone, get a set of headphones, get a reel of old tape, and go play and have some fun. Just explore it. And comment in and tell me your stories. I want to hear about your fun when you discovered a reel to reel to garage sale or something like that. Till then, I'm Chris Bowden. Remember to rate, comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz. And we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.